So tell me about the class you're teaching this week uh, and maybe the way that some of these, uh, some of the issues facing us in our culture even, uh, maybe that the apologetic method and the, the mm. hopes of the gospel and some of these things uh, relate to what's going on around us in our culture. Yeah, yes, I'm teaching a course right now, Christ, Culture, and Critical Theory. And um, we began looking at what is a, a definition of culture, what would be a, a consistent a sort of Kuyperian definition of culture. And one of the things you see, for instance, in the work of Kuyper, James Zor, et cetera, when the question of culture um, uh, is brought up, and, and frankly, the idea of, of worldview as it relates to culture, what they were advocating was a holistic rather than piecemeal approach to worldview. Now, the word worldview uh, didn't come to us first from Francis Schaeffer, but from Immanuel Kant in the critique of, uh, of judgment, critique of pure judgment. And we see the word Weltanschauung in there, uh, a, a, a viewing of the world, a way of you know seeing the world. And so folks like James Orr, uh, Abraham Kuyper, they wanted a thoroughgoingly Christocentric approach to worldview. And by Christocentric, you know, also we mean Trinitarian. You can't have one without the other. And so I think the way that, that the way we do apologetics here, a Vantilian covenantal approach to apologetics, helps with thinking about critical theory, uh, particularly because critical theory is not simply a heuristic or an analytic tool. Uh, Kimberly uh, Williams uh, Crenshaw, who it was the protege of Derrick Bell, the first African-American uh, tenured professor of law at Harvard University. He passed away, I believe, in 2007. Uh, she wrote an article uh, in the, um, the U University of Connecticut uh, Journal of Law back in 2011. And in a footnote on pages, I believe, 1256 and 57, she talks about critical theory as being possessed of an epistemology, a metaphysic, and an ethic. And so if we say, as some, I think, well-meaning but perhaps a bit naive evangelicals might say critical race theory is simply an analytic tool that helps us better apply the gospel to social issues. I think that actually fails to honor critical race theorists like Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw. I mean, she says pretty plainly, this is a worldview. This is a worldview. If you think one of the five main pieces of worldview puzzle, theology, right? The question of, of, of God. It matters, right? It matters. And particularly in a Christian worldview, in the way we're doing apologetics here, we're insisting on a Trinitarian worldview. Maybe I'll get back to that in a second. But the question of God. Anthropology. What does it mean to be man? You know, is anthropology just the study of skull fragments? I mean, are we just accidental bags of biology? Or are we gloriously created imago dei, destined for glory and redeemable, though fallen, but, but redeemable? Epistemology. How we know what we know. Are we just sort of slinging spaghetti at the wall? Or do we have an objective basis for knowing? Well, in critical theory, the approach to epistemology is what's called standpoint epistemology. My experience determines my, my value and uh, my, my experience determines the, the right I have to speak on something or to assess something uh, or to declare something. It's called standpoint epistemology. And you have no right to challenge my, epist my epistemic standing because if you challenge my uh, knowing of something, you're challenging my experience, and in so doing, you're doing violence to me. And so epistemology is grounded in the individual, in the experience. And what we're doing in class is showing how that's ultimately Kantian, um, epistemologically. You know, if you, if you go back to, say, the foundationalism of Bacon, you have a, a sort of a scientific uh, foundationalism, or Locke, an empiricist foundationalism, or Descartes, and Cartesian thought you have a rationalistic foundationalism. Can you define foundationalism? So foundationalism would be that, that say, contrary to the modern or the postmodern idea that uh, there is no such thing as a meta-narrative or an absolute truth, foundationalism would be there is absolute truth that can be known, and there is a foundation for epistemology. The way that these guys differ, say, Locke or Bacon or Descartes, is how we get to that foundation, how we assess, how we know what we know. But what they all agreed upon was that you can know with certainty. There is objective, knowable truth. They just differ on how you, you got to it. Of course, say Descartes, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And so uh, that's a rationalistic approach uh, with, with Locke. Uh, our minds are tabula rasa, and so we know by impressions being made upon the mind, or of course Bacon, 
um, a scientific, kind of an inductivist method of getting to the foundations of knowing. By the time uh, Immanuel Kant comes along, you have what is known as the Copernican Revolution in Knowledge, or the epistemic turn to the self, and where he differed, and this was because he was reacting to uh, Hume, awakening him out of his dogmatic slumber, but really where Kant differs from the earlier foundationalists is there is now a skepticism about foundationalism and objectivity and knowing, and rather than the outside world making, uh, being what it is, and we have to figure it out either inductively or it making an impression on us, now we impose our mental objects on the world outside of us. We are we can we are making an impression on uh, the world around us by our interpretation, and though Kant was he considered himself a good son of the of the Lutheran Church, did not want to create this ultimate world of skepticism. Ultimately, that's that's what happened. And so when we think about epistemology, uh, we're saying here we have an objective basis for how we know what we know, and it's revelational. How can we know anything for sure? Because our knowledge is, as Dr. Oliphant likes to say here, icon knowledge or image knowledge of the one whose knowledge is perfect, infinite, and determinative, namely God. Our knowledge is dependent, but it is dependent and an image knowledge or analogous knowledge to certain knowledge. God is not guessing. He's not doubting. He certainly knows. And if we submit to revelational a revelational approach to epistemology, we can have certainty. If we don't, then we are going to be left in the skepticism of self. And, and I mean, that's really the, the history of of, uh, of philosophy in so many ways, because after after Kant, you see the unraveling at the the epistemic level, and suddenly, as you get to the say the Frankfurt School, or you get to um, you know others say that the French uh, the French intellectuals uh, Jean Francois Lyotard wrote a book in 1979. Well, it wasn't that long ago, really. 1979, he wrote a book, La Condition Postmoderne, Report La Savoie, which is the postmodern condition, a report on knowledge. The original title of that book, if I get this right, La Condition, uh, La Condition Postmoderne, a report on font, a report for babies, or like gardening for dummies. We're like we're making postmodernism simple so that babies can understand it. And in that, he spoke of the incredulity of meta narratives. There's no overarching truth epistemologically that that is sense making uh, objectively of of, uh, of reality as we experience it. And so that had a, a, a tremendous sort of, I think, taking Kant to the next level. And we've been breathing the air of that. And so epistemologically, uh, we're talking about in our study of critical theory that if my standpoint, my experience, which may be composed of my intersectionality, uh, becomes determinative for how I know what I know, you cannot challenge that in any way. And if you do, you're doing violence against me which makes conversation, it makes meaningful dialogue completely impossible. So theology, anthropology, epistemology, metaphysics, you know, a, a, a truly Calvinistic, covenantal, Vantillian approach to worldview insists on the metaphysical distinction of creator and creature. Of course, the, the problem uh, with so many worldviews is that blurring of the line between the creator and uh, the creature Karl Marx, heavily influenced by Ludwig Feuerbach, said that that uh, God is simply a projection, particularly the Christian God, is a projection of the human mind. Uh, that's what Feuerbach said. Marx said it's just the opium of the people trying to medicate our, our pain and so forth. And so the, the distinction between the creator and the creature is done away with, just as it was in the garden, I'll be my own God, only we do it by denying that God exists, but we don't just deny that, that God exists, we substitute man for God. It's not that Marx didn't have a a view of, of God. It was simply man. And I mean, th this goes back to Nietzsche. You know, I teach you the ubermensch. Man is the meaning of the earth. You must rise up. You know, God is dead. We've killed him and we must become God to be worthy of it. So this metaphysical blurring of the creator-creature distinction uh, is something that we, in our apologetic here, in our approach, following Van Til, I think, keeps us sane in terms of metaphysics. You think, well, does metaphysics even matter? Well, you know, when you have third and fourth grade girls today wondering if their anatomy, their physical being, has any bearing on their non-physical gender identity, that's a metaphysical conundrum. 
you know, metaphysics, what, what is the nature of the material and the non-material? Well, the Bible gives that answer, right? Male and female have created them. But it's metaphysical confusion when young girls are having to ask that question. Does my physical anatomy have anything to do with my non-physical gender choice? Well, of course, the answer to that is no. There's no connection between your, according to critical theory, there's no connection between your anatomy and your non-physical gender choice. On the other hand, critical race theory would say, uh, in essence, yes, your physicality, say the physical trait of however much melanin you have in your skin or don't have in your skin is absolutely determinative for the non-physical aspect of you being a bigot or a supremacist. And so what a, a truly biblical metaphysic does is it says God is God and we are not and how has he created the, the spiritual and the material uh, and, and what is his sovereignty over both and how does the word of God help us make sense of trying to figure out the fact that we are psychosomatic holes. We are physical and we are we are non-physical. And, and what does the Bible say about this? And finally, ethics. Um, you know, theology, anthropology, epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics. Is there right and wrong and who gets to make the rules? And that comes into questions of, say, of justice. And one of the things I say is that in all the talk over the last many years about social justice, I don't think social justice is a, is a helpful category. Um, and that sometimes I'll, I'll say just to kind of wait people up when I'm teaching. I, say, I don't I actually believe in social justice. I believe in biblical justice for society. I'm not saying I'm a theonomist in that kind of a movement theonomist, but I believe in biblical justice for society. Because if we are not, if we are not thinking about matters of justice from the standpoint of who God is and who he's created man to be, then whoever has the microphone, the money, and the military might will define both social, what is society, and what is just and unjust. And uh, we can look back at, you know, well over a hundred years of, uh, of the rise of Marxism and its various forms and applications and see that it has led to degradation, ruination, impoverishment, murder. I mean, you think about Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the great Russian dissident, who when he received his Templeton Prize in religion in the early 80s, he said, I, I look back at the fact that my own people in Russia, we lost 60 million under a communist regime. And I asked the old people, how did this happen? And he said, to a person, they all say, this all happened because we forgot God. And so I think when we, when we forget God and we try to take hold of metaphysics and epistemology and ethics and do our own thing with them, uh, it only leads to ruination. And so I think what I'm trying to do here in teaching this class is not only give the history of ideas, the history of, say, modernism to postmodernism, um, kind of the, 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 the trajectory of, of ideas, because ideas matter, right? I mean, it's an old statement, ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. We're trying to look at the way that bad ideas have victimized people, but also to say what is the gospel hope that we have in it and how can a covenantal apologetic and a covenantal apologetic applied to culture help us both be like the sons of Issachar who knew the times, who knew what Israel was to do, and at the same time say that um, this hope that we're defending is a person. And say for the religious nuns, 74% of them want to be connected to something bigger, we have the privilege of saying, well, good news, you are connected to something bigger. Covenantally, you are already connected to something bigger. You are created in the image of God and you're going to either you're either going to stand before God covenantly connected to uh, the first Adam in the fall, or as you said, the second and last Adam in uh, in redemption and uh, and justification. But the good news is you are connected to something bigger, and He's Jesus. And not only is He that some that something or better someone bigger, uh, He's better than you can possibly imagine.